Oh wait, okay. I thought it, it's the, the red light we are in, like, like in Star Wars. No. <laughs> Uh, uh, so the Czech Republic is uh, an industrial country for many years, for many decades. So it uh, it helped quite a lot to uh, to enter to this domain. And uh, actually, uh, the main uh, achievement uh, at the time was uh, to persuade uh, here the community and government that space activities are not only about science. Uh, that's uh, more about economy. It's about business. And this. Uh, uh, if I if I look at uh, some other countries uh, neighboring to the Czech Republic, uh, especially to uh, Western uh, uh, sites and maybe maybe a bit further, uh, also uh, I'm, I'm not. Well, I, I can I can mention, for example, Hungary. Uh, they are not neighboring country, but they are quite close. Uh, but uh, if you look at Hungary. Uh, the Czech Republic, uh, if uh, I mentioned the, the cooperation with the European Space Agency, were the second uh, country uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the former uh, Eastern Bloc uh, who uh, started to cooperate uh, with, uh, with the European Space Agency, but was the first uh, country who exceeded the, the convention. And that's because of this what I mentioned, that we were able to change this approach, to prove that it's about uh, economy, it's about uh, business, not only about science. Because uh, nowadays uh, it's almost everything about economic benefits. And we were able to show that this is, this is, this is what, what matters in space. And that's why we were able to, uh, to go work clean uh, in implementing the first National Space Plan that's why uh, I uh, maybe I am able to say today that we are able to prove that uh, the second national space plan is a success as well. Uh, uh, and uh, now we can move ahead concerning the first, the, the, the third national space plan. It will be quite different uh, from what we now have uh, in these two uh, because we can afford to go further, uh, not only that we were able to, uh, to concentrate some, some efforts uh, to, to increase some, some, uh, some funding, uh, especially to the European Space Agency. Uh, it was quite, quite important because still uh, space is quite a lot of about uh, uh, public investments. Uh, even we see quite a lot of funding from private sector uh, but well still the the stabilization starts with states uh, especially in upstream or technology if you if you if you wish uh, so uh, this uh, this was the the first uh, um, goal to to stabilize ourselves to be able to support space activities to be able to support space industry, to be, be able to support cooperation with academia, to be able to support also science. Uh, so uh, we are we are further than a few years ago, uh, but uh, still, uh, if if you uh, see what was the goal of of the last or the present uh, national space plan, it was capacity building. Uh, it was about uh, building uh, our space industry uh, to uh, increase the cooperation with academia, to increase the international cooperation because space is not about uh, domestic markets, it's about global markets, it's about European markets. Uh, and uh, now I can say that we have quite stable space industry, uh, can be better of course and we will try to support its growth uh, even further, uh, but uh, uh, not only uh, in, uh, in, in normal way, well, just support uh, their business cases to, to assess them and to, to, uh, to, to, to motivate them to invest um, and so on, but uh, to uh, formulate some, some complex Complex areas where we believe uh, our industry can uh, can be very active uh, with some uh, 
kind of bigger added value uh, than just a conventional market to build satellites, or build uh, build rockets, launches. I mean, uh, and uh, and to 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 focus on spin off and spin in and these all spins, uh, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's that's why we are now thinking about. Uh, uh, formulating uh, some some areas where beyond the, the the commercial capacity building we would like to go uh, together with our industry and to motivate them to 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 be part of this and it's uh, uh, what uh, Peter mentioned partially um, uh, and what will be a topic of today's uh, roundtable uh, as well it's a, it's a space Mining, space, safety, and probably, or probably only secu uh, also security, uh, because we wish to support our industry uh, and its competitiveness uh, even stronger and with the higher visions, because uh, we believe that uh, uh, to support only uh, the uh, their their. Uh, way to be part of uh, part of uh, supply chains of big big, uh, big companies it 's not enough. We need to go quick and faster we need to go higher and this uh, this could help uh, these these two two, 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 two three domains. Uh, the second thing is not only about the competitiveness of our industry but it 's about also about visibility of the Czech Republic because this is the second part of our policy that we'd be, we'd wish to be more visible, more active on international forum, uh, on international European stage, uh, not uh, only through our memberships uh, in international organisations, but but uh, in bilateral bilateral uh, relations uh, with uh, with uh, some some key players, for example. Uh, a memorandum of understanding with Luxembourg uh, has been signed by our minister and in these days will be signed by uh, Minister Schneider in Luxembourg. Uh, it's on space resources. This is, this is connected to what I said, uh, space, space mining. So these, these all things uh, should help not only to uh, increase our competitiveness but also to increase our play uh, the, to the visibility of our place uh, in international community. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, so <clears throat> you mentioned that you know the role of the Czech Republic in the first uh, first space program was mainly to integrate, to build the capacities, integrate them into global or maybe some wider supply chain. So now I would go to Jakub Brosh and ask you um, what do you think are maybe the main key supply chains and uh, and, and areas that the Czech uh, space plan was able to, you know, build up the capacities in and integrate the Czech industry in, and that we can build on for 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 future. Okay. Well, uh, if you look at the Czech uh, space industry, and uh, you may as well compare it slightly to the Czech defense industry, because in some cases uh, you can see some similarities there. Uh, Czech companies that are active in the space domain are. Uh, very well established and the tradition of international cooperation with their foreign partners is quite long and if you look at some of the stories of some of the companies uh, it was sometimes really based on on luck and should we introduce the panelists yeah. okay thank you uh, because uh, they just they were lucky. They they connected with the right people from the from the big players like Airbus, uh, Thales, Alenia Space, and they set up partnerships and started supplying them with some key components. And uh, I would say that it's about the niche areas, about the niche capabilities of many Czech companies uh, spread across Czech Republic that are capable of developing and producing uh, high quality high quality products for the space space domain. And many of these companies are not that well known. Uh, there is one small company close to Klatovy in the West Bohemia that is producing uh, some parts for the Ariane 6 launchers, the new la launchers of European Union. And there are many other cases of companies that are cooperating, even with NASA, for example, or Virgin Galactic. There is really many cases of uh, really good cooperation based on niche products. So space industry is one of the areas where 
it's not about cheap manufacturing like the rest of the Czech, uh, Czech economy or Czech industry, it's about high quality products. And uh, what I think, uh, and I'm in, I totally agree with Mr. Kobera uh, in this, that we need to stimulate uh, and add up some high visions to further develop our capabilities and uh, came up with new projects uh, that would somehow uh, allow uh, Czech space industry to mature even more and to to set up uh, the possibility to have some system integrator in the Czech Republic uh, that would allow us to come up with final products not just to be part of of uh, of larger larger uh, projects uh, within the European Union but to come up with something uh, purely Czech or from most of parts produced in the Czech Republic and developed in the Czech Republic. And I think the role of the Ministry of Transportation and the Coordination Council uh, for Cosmic Activities is quite important in this because it brings all the key players with the leading role of Ministry of Transportation and other ministries, including Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Industry and Trade and others, uh, in order to coordinate the Czech space policy and came up with some ideas. Uh, one of the ways how to further or further stimulate the development of Czech space industrial capabilities is through research and development, definitely. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to have some joint uh, joint uh, leading idea or project uh, with quite a lot of funding uh, from the position of the government in order to uh, excite uh, the companies to join in and start working on specific R&D projects. So one of the areas where we should really try to be more cooperative and it's aimed mainly at the other ministries, not the Ministry of Transportation, but at the Ministry of Defense and others, is research and development to be able to put together some joint projects with larger funding in order to come up with some national, national space projects uh, that will that will compromise as many Czech uh, space companies as possible in order to come up with something with something new and uh, along with the developing bilateral cooperation like with Luxembourg as was as was mentioned and the prospects of space resources and asteroid mining uh, that, that that is one of the ways that I seem very interesting maybe just one last addition because I'm from the Ministry of Defense and of course uh, Czech Armed Forces are using some space systems and uh, space space technologies but only in the form of user you know the Czech Armed Forces as well as the others are of course using satellite communication satellite navigation uh, remote sensing capabilities but right now it's all about using the the services and the systems we do not have any Czech satellite above us uh, and uh, we will see if it's go that's going to change in the future. But uh, even though uh, the army is tightly connected with defense, defense sector and defense industry, the field where it's kind of overlapping with the space industry and civilian industry is the dual use technologies. So to use to use uh, the R and D projects to come up with something that is both usable and, and innovative, both for the armed forces and both for the civilian civilian segment. Thank you, Jakub. Um, I would just like to welcome Professor Hoffman to just join us. Um, as I said, she is an SES chair of uh, Media, uh, Satellite Communication and Space Law at Luxembourg University. Um, we will be talking about uh, asteroid mining and space resources in a bit. Uh, so I'm sure that's your uh, special specialization. Uh, but before we, we move to that, um, I would like to come back to Nicola Schmidt and maybe open up one of these uh, you know, specialty areas that uh, Mr. Kubera mentioned that Czech Republic could be focused on, and that is planetary defense. Um, you're a researcher of a, of a team that is focused on this. Um, it is a very big, attractive, exciting uh, topic. Uh, I'm sure that you hear that a lot of times. And could you maybe walk us through what are the, let's say, you know, what's, what's the threat assessment, what are the scenarios, and what are the, what are the capacities that the Czech Republic could contribute in this field uh, of planetary defense? For reminding me for, for this panel. Uh, first of all, it's uh, all the time interesting to talk about planetary defense uh, along with others, now, which are talking about more practical things now. So when you start talking about planetary defense, people start smiling now. So I'm here to tell you that there is no smile for our future if we don't have planetary defenses. However, uh, what's the planetary defense then? It's a defense from asteroids and comets now, so-called near-Earth objects, which are flying around us in the solar system. 
uh, we are capable to detect some of them and the detection is uh, significantly the capability of the detection is significantly growing why because there were two important events uh, one was in 1994 when a comet struck into the jupiter uh, dissipated into i think 24 27 uh, pieces and causes uh, plums of the material out to uh, out from uh, uh, the jupiter uh, I think to the height of about three, four thousand kilometers. So when the astronomers uh, observed uh, this disaster on Jupiter, uh, they were thinking about uh, what's going to happen on Earth uh, if a comet uh, struck us. Since then, the funding was uh, not uh, quite high uh, enough for the research, uh, even for the observation research for for the astronomers. So the very basic uh, research. However, in 2013. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm all the time making the mistake, but whether it is 12 or 13. <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was an asteroid uh, which struck to uh, the city of Chelebings, exploded about 30 kilometers above the Chelebings, and caused about 1,100 11, uh, uh, injuries uh, to the local population and uh, destroyed windows uh, in almost the whole city. So since then, uh, the budget of, for example, Planetary Defense Coordination Office in NASA more than uh, rise more than tenfold, or maybe currently twentyfold, because uh, the, uh, the budget um, also, you know, now rise uh, for about four times uh, in comparison to the previous year. So the policy of planetary defense is significantly growing, not only on the side of the observation of the asteroids and comets, but also on the side of looking for the possible solutions, uh, which are called the deflection methods. There are four main deflection methods. Uh, the first one is the kinetic impactor. The second one is a gravity tractor. The third one is a nuclear explosion, ablation. Uh, there are four different methods how to use nuclear power. And uh, the fourth one are, are lasers. Uh, we currently are working on kinetic impactor. Uh, there, were, there was a mission called Asteroid Interception Mission in ESA proposed, which was cancelled uh, because it didn't get funding about two years ago. So there's another one called HERA now, which is supposed to measure an artificial impact uh, by uh, another spacecraft called DART. DART is going to be sent by NASA and HERA will be hopefully sent by ESA if uh, the member states make the decision to fund uh, HERA. HERA is going to be there to measure whether we can uh, move a small asteroid or not uh, and what are the, or whether the mathematics uh, is going to work in practice. So um, in, even in practical way uh, there are plenty of opportunities uh, for the current uh, uh, industries and there are some, as I heard in ESA yesterday, uh, there are several possibilities of uh, Czech uh, industry contribution to the HERA mission because such a spacecraft needs to have carry various instruments uh, and one of the instruments which was uh, in discussion about four months ago, uh, not yesterday, uh, was uh, a small lander uh, on, uh, on the asteroid. So Czech Republic um, might be willing or capable finally to build even a small lander to land on, on the asteroid. However, as a political scientist, I'm not pursuing planetary defense only from this technical perspective. I much more like it uh, from the perspective of what planetary defense can do uh, to the general foreign policy or national policy. People are usually asking questions whether we need to have planetary defense uh, 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 lock and loaded. <laughs> or whether we uh, need to have a planetary defense uh, just a part of an infrastructure we are currently building in space. No? I'm favoring uh, the second, uh, the latter uh, variation because uh, uh, you can either have a nuclear weapons ready to launch in case of an imminent threat, no? but the nuclear weapons are also an imminent threat no? to the other nations uh, on Earth. No? Or, you, or you can build a particle infrastructure which can be used, for example, to uh, uh, solar system transport, interstellar transport, moving and pushing satellites on orbit, you know, which I heard yesterday is an option for, for possible future laser installations on Earth, you know, that you have a uh, satellite you know, orbiting Earth, you know, and satellites are naturally uh, falling down, you know, so we can use these lasers to pushing them up you know, and not carry you know, any, any fuel you know, on board of the spacecraft. You know. We can use lasers uh, for the solar system travel, uh, for the solar sails. Uh, so you, you use the laser to, uh, as a propellant, uh, which pushes uh, the spacecraft forward. And there are also, also options uh, for the interstellar travel, uh, which was proposed recently before he, uh, he passed out by Stephen Hawking uh, in uh, the project called Breakthrough Starshot, uh, which is led by Peter Warren, uh, uh, former NASA Ames director. 
uh, and Breakthrough Starshot are looking uh, to the technology of lasers uh, in order to send small nanoprobes uh, to Proxima Centauri in 20% speed light. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the technical perspective, there is a possibility. Uh, it's, uh, it seems to be feasible, especially because the power and effectiveness of lasers uh, are exponentially growing. And, for example, in Czech Republic, we have several uh, world-class laser research centers, ELI beams and HILAs, uh, PALS, uh, Prague Asteroid Laser System, and some others. So we invited people in Prague uh, before the summer uh, to meet with uh, the directors of uh, some of those uh, laser centers. And there's a even possibility to, to work uh, on a particular research uh, in order to link the planetary defense uh, uh, empowered by lasers no, and uh, some civilian projects. That's the dual use technology application which uh, Jakub Brosh was talking about. So planetary defense is not only about defending us from the asteroid. No, planetary defense is much more about widening the perspective of our destiny, no, thinking about that we have the capability and we have uh, the knowledge no, that the asteroids are there and we know that we have the capability or we can research the capability to defend our stand ourselves uh, from, from the asteroids. But we can also use the technology for other things, no? for, for broadening our science, for going to the stars, no? for uh, helping uh, our satellites in orbit, no? for cleaning up the orbit, for telecommunication, uh, uh, for, for transportation of the energy uh, between various stations in, in solar systems. So there are wide applications of lasers, and that's one of, uh, let's say, the technical niche and uh, which we are currently trying to explore whether we can uh, be a specific uh, contributor uh, from the perspective of world space efforts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I'm glad we moved from the uh, le rather bleak picture of uh, planetary defense and uh, clash with an asteroid to more prospectful uh, scenario of mining these asteroids. Um, but that's obviously a very attractive field uh, recently. Uh, there are many talks about you know, bringing uh, a $50 billion worth of um, asteroid of platinum to, to Earth and just gaining a lot of resources from the space. Um, but obviously that carries a lot of legal challenges and governance challenges, um, whether if it's from the contemporary legal system that prohibits any uh, appropriation of celestial objects, uh, or whether if it's from the international legal system that uh, calls for uh, benefits for to all humankind. Uh, well, now, Professor Hoffman, you were um, uh, you were part of a team that was sort of analyzing uh, the possi legal possibilities of space mining. You were also uh, cooperating with the, with the Luxembourg government, and you're also representing Luxembourg University at the space um, uh, at the Hague wor Working Group for s uh, space resources. So, what are the main challenges, and how can we sort of find the balance between? let's say, you know, incentivizing businesses to invest in planetary or planetary resources in, in asteroid mining and at the same time enforcing these, you know, international space law regimes that we have. How much time do you have? <laughs> About two minutes. No, I'm, just, I'm, I'm kidding. Why not? Uh, <laughs> I don't think you can summarize it in two minutes. You can, you can talk about 15, 15 minutes. Okay. Maybe more. Dobrý den, dámy a pánové, děkuji za pozvání na tuto výjimečnou konferenci. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation for this exceptional conference. I am very honored that uh, I have been invited to speak uh, to you today. Um, you know that uh, I studied here in Prague at the Charles University. I still keep uh, some uh, teaching uh, appointment uh, at the university, but my my main focus of my work is at the University of Luxembourg. When I applied for the position at the University of Luxembourg, it was 2010, there was no sign that space law could be something interesting. Uh, it was at the time very old-fashioned feel of international law, never applied in practice, uh, just part of the academic curricula. So uh, we started to draw our program, our master program, uh, rather in the concentration in the direction of international telecommunication law, because it's much more practical. You need the frequencies, you need the orbital slots. It is an everyday business. However, several years later, the surprise came. The Luxembourg government has announced its um, policy of uh, space resources, meaning that the government tries to attract the operators or the, uh, the NGOs 
to come to Luxembourg, to settle in Luxembourg. The government makes a lot of incentives to help uh, these entities to settle uh, in the country in the um, hope that uh, the presence of this firm will bring know-how, will bring uh, specialists in the country and will help to support substantially the research and development. And it really shows as a very uh, rational and very good policy. Indeed, uh, there are at least six uh, um, US, but also Russian, Japanese, and German um, uh, firms or companies, better said in legal terms, who created the affiliation in Luxembourg, who brought already their their uh, staff and who started to expand their activities. I can confirm because two of my students already served as internees in iSpace, for instance. So uh, the, mm, the entities or the companies are there. Uh, before this uh, mm, action or before this, uh, this policy could uh, be enlarged, the question was, however, is so-called space mining, which is a very colloquial word, uh, uh, rightly said, it is uh, uh, space uh, resources activities. Does it comply with present international space law, this old-fashioned one, and or uh, do we need any new rules? Uh, are we facing a danger that someone could say that uh, such activities would violate international law, which would be not very good position for, for the government of Luxembourg? So my team has been asked first to provide with a study which uh, analyzed the, uh, the state of uh, uh, the international law and uh, uh, we came to the conclusion that the, such activities, if provided for peaceful purposes and uh, if performed for uh, in respecting other provisions of the Outer Space Treaty like the obligation of cooperation obligation of due regard to the interests of other states or uh, like obligation to notify the results of the activities to the UN Secretary General. Such activities do not violate present international law. On the basis of this, um, of this uh, study, but of course not only on, on the basis of this study, the um, government of Luxembourg uh, has uh, initiated um, that the draft law has been created. It was not by our team, it was by another entity. And the law has been uh, approved last year. Um, I would perhaps uh, reserve the details of the legislation for the discussion. Just uh, two points. Uh, point one, uh, comparably with the US legislation from 2015, the law confirms that space resources are appropriable. And second, the legislation creates very detailed authorization procedure for the, for the operators or for, for the entities. Um, with uh, sanctions, if the entities do not respect this, uh, this legislation, they are facing several severe sanctions. Uh, uh, the summit of them would be even an imprisonment. So the legislation is, uh, has entered into force. Of course, this legislation has the advantage and disadvantage in the same, uh, same time that it focuses on space resources only. It does not cover launching activities, it does not cover remote sensing, it does not cover the uh, satellites of, uh, of uh, SES. Uh, it deals, it is focused on the space resources activities only. So um, we have been charged to provide with a draft of the general legislation on space activities of Luxembourg, uh, which we delivered to the Ministry of Communication and State last year. This general legislation would cover all other activities than space resources. Space resources most probably will remain be regulated by this specialized law. 
but this, this new legislation would provide for authorization procedure for other space activities under the jurisdiction of Luxembourg. This new legislation has not been um, approved by the Parliament yet. Uh, at present you will find it on the website of the Parliament, it's in the parliamentary discussion and uh, we hope that during the autumn, but there are elections in Luxembourg, uh, it can also be some uh, effector, but we hope that uh, the legislation will be adopted during this year. So there are these two points. The second point w which I would like to mention is the international framework. So we already said that uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, space resources activities do not violate present international law. It is not a view who, which is shared by everyone. Uh, th those of you who are participating in the UN uh, meetings of the UN Committee for Outer Space know that there are uh, states like uh, Belgium, is uh, typically uh, one of them, or uh, some Latin American countries led by Argentine who are very decisively against uh, this position and would like to see a adoption of an international legal framework which would in detail uh, par um, which would in detail regulate how these activities should be, uh, should be done and most possibly they would like to see some sort of distributory or planned regime comparable to this which is already envisaged in the so-called Moon Agreement but Moon Agreement has been ratified by 18 states only, not, neither by Czech Republic nor by Luxembourg. And uh, uh, they would like to see uh, uh, an international institution which would deliberate the requests of the operators, would uh, uh, distribute some sort of licenses and would uh, control how the conditions of the licenses are uh, respected. We see this regime already in the uh, deep sea bed in the uh, area where we have an international organization seated in Jamaica which distributes the licenses for mining in the deep sea bed. Today, until now, there were approximately 20 licenses which have been issued by this um, institution, so uh, we doubt whether it is a good example and whether it is a really effective regime how to deal with it. So uh, the discussion are, discussions are, are led. Uh, Luxembourg is very much involved in these discussions. Luxembourg is very open to all uh, negotiations, positions, uh, exchange of views, seeking for partners, uh, creating also bilateral cooperation. Luxembourg has adopted uh, six uh, uh, agreements of mutual understanding until now with uh, other countries and uh, um, uh, Luxembourg is also participating in an initiative which started some three years ago and it is so called Hague uh, Space Resources uh, Group and it is my last point I would like to focus today. It is an international um, very heterogenic group uh, which uh, has been uh, created under the auspices, so to say, of the government of Netherlands. Netherlands has a long experience from the area of international sea law and it uh, combines the um, actors from uh, ministries, from operators, from universities, but also individuals. The outcome of the two years of the work of this uh, um, group are so-called building blocks uh, which uh, already um, pre envisage some rules how the future regime of space resources activities could look like in the future. So um, the core of these rules is for instance the principle that um, it should be some sort of international registry 
which would register the priority rights of the operators on the basis of the first came, first served principle. And with the registry in this, uh, um, in this instrument, the operator would require some sort of international protection. So no one would be entitled to come to the same position, same place, and would try to, uh, would be entitled to uh, seek uh, uh, space resources activities in the same place. The, um, if you would say that this reminds you very much to the principles of International Telecommunication Union, you would be completely right. Um, I suspect that the authors, when having started off on these principles, inspired very much with the model of the ITU. Uh, which, uh, as you know, worked successfully for decades, if not centuries, and uh, um, which uh, uh, really helps to avoid cases of harm for interference uh, in telecommunication, in this interference uh, of radio communication. In this case of the Hague building groups, it is the harm for interference with the activities of the operators. So. Uh, I would like to stop here to enable uh, you to uh, raise questions. Um, to conclude, uh, uh, I would like to conclude with a personal note. Um, perhaps it is time uh, really to start working uh, in this area. Um, uh, the, uh, those, the opponents of these activities very frequently think that they must be a lot of precious metal, uh, metals and uh, uh, that uh, it would be some golden rush uh, uh, comparable to the earliest days of the US and that the space environment would be completely destroyed. I am much more sober in this area. I think that the idea is to get uh, water, if possible, and it is the idea to get uh, means which would enable on-orbit operations and which would enable also the further space flights without the necessity to go back always to the Earth. Whether it is an economically viable solution or not, I would like to let uh, some of you who are specialists in uh, economy, uh, but uh, uh, I would say uh, let's do it and uh, I don't see uh, any serious legal obstacles against it. Thank you. Thank you for the great summary. Uh, maybe I would uh, follow up with a, with a quick question regarding the building blocks of the of the Hague group. Um, uh, you mentioned the ITU and how they, you know, um, authorize and orbits also frequencies for radio communication. Um, but that's not the case of the Hague group, uh, right? Because if I understand correctly, the Hague group expects expects states and national administrations to review plans for. Uh, space resources activities and for them to give authorization. Is that right? Would the, would, the, would the responsibility still fall to states or would the Hague Group envision some sort of a global authority that would be granting, not just doing the registry, but granting the authorization for uh, space resources uh, missions and so on? Uh, um, building blocks are not precise in this area. Um, it must be seen that it is a compromise which uh, was elaborated by the colleagues uh, from uh, practically all of the world, including uh, the uh, silent uh, Russian participant and uh, others. So it is not completely clear. Um, I think that the, um, also the ITU system is based on the interstate contact. So also in the ITU, the operators are approaching first the national authority and the national authority files uh, with uh, the ITU. So I think that the system should be sim the similar one. It should uh, be the operators who would approach the national authority and this would uh, then contact the international mechanism for international registration. 
Okay, thank you. Um, well, since the Czech Republic hopes to um, expand their uh, focus on asteroid mining, I would maybe you know, ask uh, Václav Kobera if, um, <clears throat> without uh, you know indulging into what actual Czech position is, obviously, but uh, what would be what would be maybe the industrial capacity and let's say uh, political. Uh, interest of the Czech Republic to get into asteroid mining. What would be the approach um, that would be suitable here, or that you uh, that you can comment on? Okay, thank you for the question. Well, it's not an easy one. Uh, uh, as I as I said uh, in my, my previous intervention, so there are two areas where the Czech Republic wishes to to be uh, is a capacity, I mean, because we believe that our capacities, industrial capacities, in the, uh, capacities can be used in this area. Uh, and, uh, well, it's quite complex, not just, well, I would name uh, one technology and, and another. Uh, we are building uh, some, not building blocks, but we're building blocks of, of capacities to be more competitive. And uh, it, it's linked uh, to the second part, is the visibility. And we believe that it's, it's, a, it's a politically important and economically important area uh, because we think that uh, this can help our industry and the name of the Czech Republic. Of course, how we would contribute in this particular uh, area, it's uh, something to be discussed. Uh, What's uh, important to be there, uh, because we wish to be in, in the train before uh, it's set up, uh, set, set out of, of the set of, 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 of the uh, of the track. So it's it's important to be in in the game, uh, not uh, too late uh, as in other areas, because we are coming, and when we go through all the procedures, then uh, it's too late. So this this is something which we. I, I believe that it's important to be to be in the game uh, at the very beginning. So uh, I have uh, actually uh, no firm opinion how uh, the, the system will work. Uh, what I know, we need uh, an consent on the global uh, stage. So I'm uh, quite convinced that uh, the, the way the Hague group goes uh, and the, the entities is quite correct because we need some some active approach uh, and if I see COP wars and if I see UN uh, the last uh, international agreement was uh, adopted in uh, 70s so it's quite a long, long time ago and we we need to see some um, you know injunction injection so that's that's what I think the hate group can uh, can uh, can bring uh, together with uh, the, the the states involved to inject uh, some topics uh, with some uh, mature enough uh, agenda to uh, the standard uh, procedures of COP because at the end of the day it's the global uh, global uh, entity to to talk about and uh, and decide. Because uh, what we are looking for, uh, it's a common understanding how these things uh, would uh, would be done in future. Uh, not only uh, particular uh, approaches uh, made by Luxembourg or or, or the U.S., uh, but a global approach uh, where uh, the majority of states are quite satisfied. Uh, so in this in this case, I, I think, as I said, to uh, to uh, uh, to support our entities uh, in being there on time. Uh, we are negotiating. We are talking with companies uh, abroad. We are participating in in the missions, uh, as uh, Nicolas mentioned, the Hera mission. We wanted to support a mission in Australia, impact mission, together with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Vice Prime Minister Schneider. Uh, last Minister Council in ISA. Unfortunately, it was the only uh, program which was, which was which was not opened uh, at the time because of some priorities. And this may be uh, one of the issues for future as well because uh, space safety, security, mining, and these all things can be easily sacrificed. 
concerning the, uh, the investments of states because uh, in this particular thing we still need some investments from states uh, to stabilize technologies, to stabilize uh, the growth, uh, not only uh, private initiatives. Of course we see quite a lot of money coming from private investors uh, but without uh, state initiatives the technologies uh, will not be here today. Thank you. Uh, it indeed is not an easy question. Luckily, we have a political scientist on the panel. Uh, Nikola Schmidt, are there any lessons we could learn for the cooperation in the space field on asteroid mining, on, uh, let's say, uh, space and space situational awareness from the field of planetary defense, which should be sort of a, a you know, a good reason to, uh, to cooperate in space? Are there any lessons we can learn or any, you know, ideas that could be applicable somewhere else? Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think so. That there are lessons which are have happened already. I think that there are lessons which are currently learning because uh, either planetary defense uh, or uh, asteroid mining are really new new topics uh, in space, uh, especially because of the budgets uh, which have been uh, rising, as I said, you know, in planetary defense. Ten years ago, planetary defense was just about the astronomy. Currently, planetary defense is much more about uh, uh, um, building the international network of cooperating institutions and based on some uh, uh, sharing of knowledge now. Yeah. Because the, one of the biggest problems still today, you know, which I didn't <laughs> know even yesterday, but I was told that yeah, it's still a very big problem, that there are different astronomical uh, observatories you know, and they are still not successfully sharing the data you know, accordingly you know, because they don't have the same language uh, uh, I mean the data language you know, or the database tables you know, when they are uh, looking in, uh, to the sky and finding new asteroid you know, uh, they need to follow up the asteroid you know, so despite the fact that the astronomy has been cooperating last 350 400 years you know, uh, still the current cooperation between them is, is not 100 percent perfect you know. And uh, planetary defense is uh, primarily about the observation. Because right now we have a huge amount of uncertainty, but in near future we hope we are going to lower this uncertainty. So we will not need to talk about the possible nuclear weapons, because we will probably know most of the orbits uh, of the asteroids that threaten us. And then the whole planetary defense uh, as an agenda will significantly change, uh, because uh, uh, because there will not be that momentum that we need to have some technology uh, lock and loaded, you know, especially when it comes to nuclear weapons, uh, because some asteroids can come without uh, without warning time, you know, like uh, four days, five days. That's happening like every single morning. That an asteroid is flying close to Earth you know, to distances around one moon. You know, an asteroid which can destroy a city is simply swinging around. You know, uh, the Earth, uh, and we don't see them because they are small. Uh, so what we see here, uh, we, we see, we know about the population of asteroids which are one kilometer and high and, and more, but we don't know about uh, the asteroids. We, we don't see the asteroids which are about 50 to 150 meters, uh, and these can destroy the cities, uh, and they are flying really you know, very often around. Uh. So planetary defense is a nice platform for growing cooperation because uh, the states need to discuss. Uh, what kind of knowledge they are willing to share when it comes to the observation it's not the problem when it comes to the possible deflection systems kinetic impactors are not the problem but as uh, my colleague Václav Koraba men mentioned uh, there is no willingness to support these missions and I heard it yesterday in person that uh, after the presentation of the current space uh, secur security and safety program in ESA uh, Germany and France immediately step in to mention that they don't have enough money for that and uh, despite the fact that there were talks uh, from ESA directly trying to ask uh, the member states, please uh, raise a question, how you are going to explain your citizens that you did have the capability and finally you did not act because you didn't give us this small budget. So uh, I see various levers of possible cooperation. First of all, as a political scientist, I like to see strong argument that the that the member states or say, these delegates you know, coming back to their governments you know, are explaining to the government that the planetary defense is, uh, is uh, not just uh, an agenda necessary from the perspective of our security, but also an agenda 
uh, which can stimulate the cooperation between states and which can finally stimulate uh, some technologies that can have interesting spin-offs you know, like the lasers. And there are other uh, levels of uh, cooperation when uh, states or say the global community decides you know, that there is a very specific uh, technology to be built like uh, the lasers we have been talking about. You know, states will have to uh, discuss how such a huge installation uh, which definitely is going to have a dual use uh, capability to be used uh, in the military purposes, you know, how such an installation should be governed. You know, where there is one state to govern the installation or whether there is supposed to be an international body, new body. Security Council. So th these are the questions you know, which uh, haven't been discussed yet. You know. So there are plenty of new opportunities you know, to cooperation rather than lessons learned. You know. Well, and then there are other areas than just planetary defense. Obviously, one of the big issues on the space agenda is the space situational awareness and the problem of space debris. Jakub, are you seeing um, any any sort of uh, lessons we can learn from cooperation in this area uh, that could be applicable somewhere else? Or is this still also the same issue that nation states are just not uh, having enough resources or not having enough will or understanding of the threat to sort of nurture um, an effective international cooperation in this field? Perfect. Thank you for the question. Uh, I have a couple of points and topics, and thank you for raising the space debris issue or the whole problem with the budgeting for these uh, areas like space debris, uh, situational awareness and such. Because very often, uh, as I come from the Ministry of Defense, talking about space is about the space security and the issues of so-called rogue moves by some satellites in the orbit and the potential danger or hazardous impact of these activities. And I'm always replying that uh, I think there are far more uh, likely events that can occur uh, regarding the space safety and security. And one of the important uh, things to do in order to mm -hmm. get the money from the national states and have increased budgets is to raise the general awareness of this, that uh, space debris is a serious problem and uh, we should tackle this problem not on a national level basis but on the global or international basis because it's something that can affect everyone. If one satellite, and we saw these examples in the past, if one satellite got destroyed, uh, the debris will affect others and, and it's a continuous problem like an avalanche. So uh, in this case, just yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, there was the successful testing of the, of the debris catcher, of the, it was the British, British, uh, British project that was uh, deployed from the International Space Station, deployed small testing cube set and catch it with a net. That was just some sort of uh, first, first test, how to, how to approach this issue. So yes, space debris uh, should be one of the main issues, um, how to somehow rally together and came up with some new ideas and funding for, for, for this topic because if we are not going to uh, handle this issue soon, it's going to be more and more difficult to get something into the orbit or into the deep, deep space. The same thing is collision avoidance. Uh, how to ensure that uh, with the number of satellites on orbits, but yes, it's true that the, the space space is a large, large, uh, large area, and it's not like that it's crowded there, but it, it is, and uh, not all the companies are prepared to handle the collision avoidance uh, incidents in timely manner and have the have the right instruments for that. So that's another issue. Uh, so space security or rather space safety, it's about this issue. It's about space weather and solar storms that can affect the satellites and due to that it can affect many services here on earth that are used by everyone and people are not aware of that that some something's happening on the sun surface so long uh, so 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 uh, so far away from here uh, can affect their daily routines be it using atms or traveling by airplane or even by trains in these days so uh, this awareness uh, regarding how it can affect the whole population uh, it should be really one of the one of the key topics uh, regarding the involvement of Czech industry in current projects. Mr. Kobra mentioned the Hira project. Czech companies are also involved, for example, in the Juice uh, Jupiter Icy Moons uh, probe, that is spacecraft that is being prepared by the European Space Agency. There are many many involvement in many in many projects that have some connection with the topic of asteroids, uh, asteroids mining, or even going to the deep space. Uh, and I think it's uh, extremely important to be involved in these projects, even as a subcontractor or 
um, or providing just some neat solutions because it's going to help us in learning and all these missions, be it HERA, be it uh, DOE mission or currently the Japanese uh, agency JAXA mission Hayabusa 2, that is right now at this very moment, it's approaching the asteroid Rigo again uh, to send a first probe on its surface. It, there's going to be more, 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 more activities like this, including a mascot lander from the European Space Agency. Uh, those are the pioneers of the activities, how to approach and land on asteroid and do something with it, take samples and in the future get the resources from it. And if you look at the prices of these missions, uh, for example, the price of Hayabusa 2 mission was estimated at least 150 million US dollars, but it's going to be far larger. The price of Rosetta mission of the European Space Agency was 1 billion euros, so it's pricey. And, but through these uh, missions that are completely funded by the, by the national agencies and national states in the international, international agencies like ESA, uh, you are learning a lot and you can facilitate the, the technologies for further use and you can lower the prices in the future and that's opening the gates for the private, private companies and entities for the operators in the future to, to b build on these technologies and use them for potential asteroid mining. So I think it's important to support the involvement of Czech, of Czech space industry in these missions in order to learn and increase the knowledge and experience and be prepared for the future even private, uh, private uh, uh, activities in the field of asteroid mining. Uh, that's that's how, I, how I see it and I really think that speaking of space safety and security, space debris, uh, situational awareness, collision avoidance are the key topics, not, uh, not rogue satellites or anything like that. I think and I hope that we are far away from it and that space will still remain uh, the peaceful environment as it is now and we will not add any more complication because how you could see in the past it only takes one electric drill to make a <laughs> big incident in, uh, in space and not, not nothing more so we should stay and support this, uh, this, this policy. Thank you. Well, we have the Space Force now that's going to protect us, right? Um, well, uh, it seems that there's a, a threat from the space debris, uh, planetary defense. Uh, there's a great potential to build up space economy uh, using space resources. Uh, so what is, what is the catch then? What is the constraints on the international cooperation on sort of overcoming these national outlooks and actually fostering some sort of working regime that would not only raise awareness but raise money and raise the prospects of you know, doing things together in space? Thank you for this question. I think uh, from my perspective the main obstacle is the position towards uh, the interpretation of the province of mankind or common heritage of mankind principle. Um, they are uh, states which are convinced that uh, um, the common heritage uh, um, of mankind um, means even for the states who did not ratify the, the Moon Agreement, means that that must be some sort of uh, permissive distributory mechanism which uh, decides whether a state or an operator is allowed to perform uh, such activity or not. And the other states who say, no, uh, first we are not bound by common heritage of pr uh, mankind principle and we are bound by the province of mankind, meaning that there are many levels how the international cooperation can be structured. It does not mean that uh, some sort of uh, distributory mechanism has to be created. It means, and uh, I would give examples of UN resolutions which uh, confirm this, pro this position, it can mean that also contracting is the mean to uh, implementing of province of mankind. Uh, it does not mean that uh, there is a prescribed mechanisms, uh, mechanism that, that can be everything which enables uh, the uh, other, the participants from other states uh, to take part in these endeavors. And here I am. I have also one uh, again personal position. I would say then that in order to comply with the province of mankind principle, which we are bound to, because Czech Republic is party of the Outer Space Treaty, Luxembourg is party, we should perhaps think how, on the practical terms, we could invite 
colleagues from developing countries, let's say from African or from, from uh, other uh, poor, poor countries, to participate in our projects. And it does not mean that we have to distribute uh, Czech crowns or euros. Uh, it can be completely different means of cooperation. We can, for instance, uh, allow the students to participate in our, in our master studies in our countries. Uh, we can invite them to uh, be internees in uh, some of the companies which are not defense uh, sensitive. Uh, so uh, there are many means how to do so, and I am. I think that it would be very welcome. I have uh, received this impression from the discussions with from the colleagues from uh, these countries, and it would be a practical way how uh, we would implement the province of mankind principle. So to involve the colleagues from these countries or the youth uh, from these countries as much as possible in the projects which allow such involvement. We are not naive, of course, but uh, we should think which would, which would be the, better, the best means to, to do so. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> another topic that was raised here is, um, in, in the space area is the growing prominence or, let's say, strength or power related to knowledge uh, of private actors, of uh, non-governmental entities. Um, now, in the, in the Hague Working Group, uh, it's not only nation states, right? It's uh, also uh, uh, universities, uh, private sectors, and so on. So, <clears throat> how should, uh, and this is this goes to all the panelists, uh, uh, how should the, let's say, the growing power of these non-governmental entities should be reflected in the governance system, in the way they can influence, you know, opinion making, decision making, and how? What is the best way to incorporate them? into uh, some of these some of these decision making procedures um, we can see that in high group uh, they're obviously able to um, influence the legislation forming of legislation recommendations but anywhere else they do not have that big of a power as they do on the market and on actually you know opening up the space opportunities I can start one. It's, it's not easy question because well you're now in a new domain uh, to to look at new actors, uh, not big actors. Many times it's very small actors. If uh, we talk about iSpace, for example, it's 80 people. Uh, some others, uh, it's just few people. Planetary resources, well, it's said, you know, uh, end of their uh, activities, probably. Uh, new space, it's uh, these space industries, it's uh, quite a small company as well. Uh, it's not transnational company, uh, which we are talking about, but well, we are talking about big interests coming from very wealthy people. Uh, and this is maybe uh, something which uh, should be explored. Uh, well, I will uh, maybe uh, talk about uh, uh, the, the way forward, because it's uh, about the governments, you mentioned that you wanted to have reactions. Uh, it's, uh, I had some talks with these companies and with these uh, entrepreneurs and people, and uh, they are quite uh, critic, tricky, critical concerning the, the efforts of s national states uh, and their investments. Uh, and uh, I, I must say that uh, partially I can uh, understand what they are talking about. Of course, uh, what I said uh, in my previous intervention was, is correct because today we are where we can be because only only because of the private, uh, pu public investments, uh, the technologies which we are here, which we can use, uh, which uh, also are used in the disruptive uh, approaches by non-space sectors like. Google or others, uh, which uh, uses uh, uh, the capacities of space industry uh, in planning their goals. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's changing uh, the, the 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 spectrum of our uh, activities. So uh, I, uh, the, their their uh, concern is that states are not that ambitious. Uh, and uh, when I go to s International Space Exploration Forum, 
Uh, it's, it's a platform which started some 10 years ago in the Czech Republic, someone uh, may know. It's about in Stirin, the first conference. Uh, even the, 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 the this year conference was called ISF, Inter Space Inter uh, International Space Observation Forum 2. It was not the, the second one, but it's, there were quite a lot of discussions in the past. Uh, it's about how to uh, cooperate together and this, I believe, in the future can help us to build really ambitious, really ambitious pro projects. Not to, not to uh, uh, duplicate uh, something which is now being, uh, becoming more private. Uh, we talked about uh, Peter Warden and his breakthrough initiatives. Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, initiatives which uh, are trying to uh, go to the domain uh, which was uh, which was uh, so far uh, states uh, or international organizations uh, uh, domain uh, like space exploration. So uh, space mining, uh, blind defense, and these all things. It's from my point of view uh, the real ambitious projects which should be more cooperate uh, coordinated on the global level and uh, this is where we should go not to duplicate as I said uh, the, the efforts over of, of, uh, of private uh, companies uh, and they will grow these 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 these, uh, these activities of course uh, still for the the players like the Czech Republic uh, even small activities are quite big uh, well but well we need to distinguish between the, the global scale and uh, only Czech uh, scale or uh, kind of Czech states, well, Czech, Czech state uh, uh, um, uh, scale, uh, and uh, to uh, to support uh, support uh, what is uh, is necessary to support. So I'm coming back to. Uh, to what uh, what's our policy to support our industry to be part of something bigger uh, and to support the Czech Republic to be visible if I may <coughs> uh, yeah you you are asking uh, what is the role of uh, non state actors yeah I would you know distinguish it between different categories of non state actors because there are small companies now which are having high ambitions now and which would like to see really well done uh, policies uh, by their governments uh, in order to have doors open for big projects uh, like what uh, our republic is uh, definitely doing. But you, then you have non-state actors that are definitely having disruptive effects. Uh. They don't care about the governments. They are simply, they have enough money to do whatever they want. Uh, and if they simply you know, de uh, define the target, uh, they will do whatever they can uh, to, to reach the target. Uh. And uh, Elon Musk is one example because uh, he was so convinced uh, that he has enough money and capability to build the first rocket when he was refused by the Russians uh, that he simply decided to invest all of his almost all of his money. Uh, he didn't have money to pay his own rent uh, just to build a rocket. Uh, and uh, of course, there are different perspectives uh, from United States and NASA. Uh, what was finally the decision uh, to support COTS program now, which gave them enough money to say continue now with the program. Uh, one of them could be, we need uh, a launcher uh, to, to launch things in space. Or we need to have the company under control. <laughs> because if we don't have this kind of company under control, they can do whatever they want. Yeah? Like sending their cars into space uh, and making a nice shows. And there are others, uh, which people which are having billions uh, to invest into space. Uh, I don't want to make the breakthrough star show as an example, yeah, but uh, it's obvious example. Because if you go through the board of uh, breakthrough initiative, it's full of icons in science. Yeah. These are not just you know famous scientists. This, these are icons, yeah. and icons are of course glue of uh, for for some uh, philanthropist money. Yeah. So. If those icons are capable to deliver the needed research and you know, to develop particle lasers, you know, it's uh, not going to be about states or security council, but those philanthropists to simply build the technology. You know. And in this perspective, uh, I would say that planetary defense agenda is constitutive in the perspective of uh, some new political structures.
because states will be put into a situation that they will either let them do it you know, without uh, any ability to oversee them, to have them under control, or they will simply develop uh, the foundation, uh, uh, international law framework foundation, some kind of uh, pillar for those uh, philanthropists you know, to, to deliver their ideas. You know. Because in past, you know, uh, and I was surprised when I opened uh, Internet and decided to study uh, the impact of philanthropy in uh, in, in recent uh, centuries, uh, and uh, especially when it comes to astronomy, uh, astronomy and its development was significantly funded by the philanthropists in the last several hundred years. Uh, and if you let's say take uh, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, from the political perspective, this time uh, yeah, we had some Rockefellers, uh, but that time uh, there were not too many wealthy people in the world. Uh, right now, we have so many wealthy people in the world. Uh, which are having ideas to uh, to go to space. No? So it's not only about SpaceX breakthrough, it's also about uh, Branson, about Virgin Galactic, about some uh, some of the companies, no? and they are going to show up. No? When I was uh, in Cora Clara, International Astronautic Congress two years ago, I attended a small panel, a small say, presentation room, no? which was only about suborbital launchers. No? And I was surprised how many companies no, are pouring so many money no? into something what is not visible to media no? because it's not going to orbit no? so nobody cares. No? But when they develop this kind of technology to sell it to tourists, no? they, work, they make money and they can go to the orbit uh, using the next uh, phase of the rocket. No? So it's not only about four or five companies, it's maybe about dozens of companies no? which are already developing technology which is <laughs> not uh, currently uh, say the uh, need chain uh, interest uh, of, uh, of the governments because the companies are doing there so why the governments should do it for more money uh, for much more money uh, so and this is going to move to space uh, so when it comes to asteroid mining uh, I think my personal prediction is there will be simply one moment uh, when somebody simply invest enough money into uh, the first attempt and be successful uh, because uh, planetary resources we see that they reach several interesting objectives and then they fade out uh, because they simply didn't raise enough money, but the capability or the, the expertise is still there, yeah. and these ex these people which were working for years on asteroid mining are going to simply, I guess, bell the ring somewhere else, yeah. and somebody will fund it one day. Yeah. Yeah. So it's time for states yeah, to simply realize that they are not going to govern the world as a group of 193 uh, states. And they have to develop a working platform uh, how to how to make uh, uh, good decisions and how to prepare these pillars for uh, for upcoming uh, companies, especially those disruptive companies. Thank you. And this is also not a question of planetary resources, but uh, things as colonization of other planets as um, the cost of setting up a moon base or even a you know a base on Mars are reaching the capacities of private entities um, and that's one of the reasons why Elon Musk is planning on going there um, so I would just extend this question uh, to the right side of the panel what should be the role and what do you see the role of uh, non-governmental entities and space governments global governments in future to come to come in areas as asteroid mining planetary uh, space resources and colonization first Jakub. well uh this is an interesting topic because uh, the role of private entities is definitely disruptive. It's great. Uh, I fully support their activities. I fully support SpaceX and many other companies, as Nicola mentioned. Uh, but it is good to you know stay on the ground and be aware of the fact that yes, they are their money. It's it's business. They are investing their private money to develop these capabilities. But it's as I mentioned previously it's about the pioneering role of the national agencies and public public bodies like NASA uh, SpaceX want to go to Mars to moon that's great and I think they will manage to do it and I, I I'm really looking forward to the day when the first uh, BFR will uh, land on Mars or moon uh, but it's because previously there have been these missions into the deep space by by NASA and now SpaceX and other private companies can employ former employees of NASA and uh, other other agencies and institutions. Uh, and also, one very important fact, uh, private entities, and it's absolutely logical and, and normal, uh, they need profit. So they are doing things where they can get some profit back, be it asteroid mining or taking tourists around the moon or to Mars in the future. Uh, but 
I'm really not sure if we ever, and it would be great, but I'm really not sure if you ever see a private company funding some poorly scientific mission into the deep space, sending New Horizons pro probe to Pluto just to take just to take pictures and get the scientific data. So I, I can see that's the divide, like that the national agency, so they should do the research, the development, the scientific missions, and cooperating closely with private entities that can provide them with launchers, for example. Uh, very discussed topic of today is the NASA space launch systems. Very expensive, built on all technologies, uh, completely not reusable, uh, taking a lot of time, spending a lot of money, uh, partly because you need to give jobs to specific parts of NASA and the contractors in order they can survive. So uh, that's a part of our thinking. So why is SpaceX building and developing BFR and why is NASA doing the SLS? You know, uh, there are some arguments against it, some ar arguments in favor. That's a thing where we should or where the agencies should uh, rethink their approach. Even Charles Bolden, former NASA administrator during Obama presidency, he was very critical of SpaceX and, for example, even cooperation with uh, China and other, other things. And I heard him talking last year uh, at one space conference and he admitted, uh, it was quite moving because he was in tears, he admitted that he was wrong and that there should be a change in the, in the mindset of NASA and other agencies, how to incorporate private entities and countries like China that on some levels might be, uh, might be seen as adversaries, but in the space domain there should be our partners, while there are no Chinese on the space stations and other topics like that. So it should be about dividing what should stay in the hands of national national agencies uh, or public, public institutions, scientific missions, research and development, uh, deep space exploration, and what should be the role of the, of the private entities, providing the launchers, providing the technologies, uh, working on them, uh, be the operators. Uh, in the future asteroid mining or space resources because asteroid mining that's one part you can talk about the whole cis lunar uh, economy and, uh, and, and moon bases and everything like that ESA is talking about the moon base or moon village for quite a long time but uh, so far there has been no specific uh, steps to move ahead with this and so that's that's the key goal for all of us should be to somehow s came up with a new new setup how to make this work as efficient as possible so we won't spend uh, a dollar more than it's actually needed because of so many entities working on uh, overlapping projects and things to fuse the capabilities the money uh, the dedication uh, thank you. So I would uh, add uh, one uh, legalistic perspective again um, to my perspective and not only to mine. Uh, I think that the operators should be involved in the shaping of the future international regime. But how to do so? So today they are involved in the Hague Space Resources uh, Working Group, but of course it's not the UN, it's not the body which adopts uh, binding rules. Uh, perhaps these rules were once brought to the attention, or were brought already to the attention of the UN, and can, can serve uh, like a basis for the international regime. What I would like to say is that the Inter the new international regime should involve the non-state entities in the form as they are involved, for instance, in the creation of the ITU rules. You know that uh, non-state entities are heavily involved in so-called sectors of the ITU where they really create the, uh, the, uh, the substance of the upcoming rule, uh, rules. The only uh, it, um, difference from the states is that the, they cannot vote but they create the substance. So um, we spoke about it uh, on the Moscow UN conference, uh, you mentioned sh uh, shortly, um, that it is really um, 
surprising that very few uh, non-state actors are members of the uh, national delegations to the UN COPUOS, uh, that there are only uh, very few examples where the US delegation can afford someone to invite as a, as a member of the delegation. And uh, the colleagues from the UN Secretariat said that the, the system has not been drawn like to accept them and to, to let them speak and to let them to, to present uh, their ideas in the name of a state. So to make my remark shorter, uh, I would say that we should think about the involvement of the non-state actors in the same manner as it is the case in the ITU. Thanks. Thank you. Um, as we are moving towards the end of the panel, um, maybe we should return to the whole name of it, uh, Future of Humanity in Space and the Role of Czech Republic. So uh, for the final round of remarks, I would ask each participant, each panelist to maybe quickly summarize what their vision for um, the future of humanity in space is, specifically obviously what the role the Czech Republic should play. And, um, if you're looking for some sound bites, maybe when is the Czech Republic going to have its uh, Mars colony? Okay. Uh, well, my vision is that the Czech Republic plays active role. <laughs> this is the most important thing. Active uh, is uh, uh, the key for everything. Because if we are active, we can build our industry more easily uh, to persuade people here that it's uh, it's worth it to focus on it uh, and then to be visible. I would like to see Czech politicians every single day talking to TV about space instead of migrants which are not here. <laughs> because the space is out there and uh, we have it you know above our heads every single day uh, we, we don't know enough about it still, and yeah, it's a kind of idealistic, of course, no, perspective. No, but uh, you know, this is something which, which surprised me so much that people are taking care about things that are not existent, no, and they are making up them just to take care about them. No, you know, the point of securitization theory. Uh, sorry, I tried to explain it in a human language no, instead of electrical <laughs> science language. But uh, space can be so inspirational that people will think, uh, okay, it makes sense what we are doing, that our research is uh, working well. Uh, you, you hear your politicians that we are still uh, constructing these cars here uh, and don't have the high-end uh, research centers. Uh, that's not true, though, because they don't know about it. Uh, they are not coming to places like this to talk about, uh, uh, to talk about uh, possible uh, laser development for sending probes to stars no? and when Pete Warren was leaving LI beams he said okay so if they, if they don't have enough public money we can build a new building no? and this is something what the political uh, representatives should know, you know that uh, as I said if they don't step in you know the philanthropists will step in because uh, they have these visions they have the ideas and they, they, they would like to see uh, the humanity moving forward no? so that's what I would like to see having politicians which are having visions uh, and which are pushing the society forward somehow. Okay. Yeah, so I definitely agree that we must go farther, we must go deep into this space, we must continue the effort to explore. Uh, somehow it's, it's a little bit strange uh, if you look at the past, how the humanity was exploring first its own planet, then the surrounding, and then there was the peak with the first moon landing 50 years ago, and it kind of stopped back in there and now now I think it's a great time because of the private entities doing amazing stuff <laughs> in space and both on earth uh, and we should uh, really try to set up a collaborative effort with with strong role of the Czech Republic and I totally agree it's about the politician would start taking taking note take notice about this thing and talk about them more than than the other non-important non-existing things uh, because we have many bright minds in the Czech Republic. I think that the potential of uh, Czech, Czech scientists, researchers, and uh, entrepreneurs is quite, quite, quite large. On the other hand, uh, I don't think everybody will agree with me, but the Czechs tend 
to be, you know, in their small, calm Czech Republic, not taking care a lot about what's going on in general. So it's about also shaping the mentality or changing the mentality a little bit, which is very difficult and kind of naive task. But those who are interested should be involved in the collaboration globally to, to move ahead step by step, uh, to go further. And uh, I really, what, what I have noticed recently, the arguments, we should not you know, go to Mars, we should take care about the planet Earth, about the environment, but it's, it's complementary. Uh, that's another important fact. I don't like this techno pessimism <laughs> that is uh, spreading recently in some in some circles. We can do both. We can help and research cancer, and uh, we can produce tons of ice creams a year. You know, so the humanity is doing both stupid, unimportant things and very important and amazing things. So uh, we should continue with it, and we should make people aware that many things that are helping now here on Earth to better develop originally for space programs. So, and the, the Czech Republic can play an important role in that, be involved, and thus in the end it's going to create more, um, more working, working, uh, working spots, employment, rise employment, increase the budget income. It's, it's a circle and somehow we must manage to, to show it to people and to persuade the right, the right stakeholders. That's my take. Thank you. So it's difficult to add uh, something substantial uh, to uh, these three speeches. Um, I would like to say that um, we should see that uh, Czech Republic has an immense tradition in uh, space uh, uh, area and it has in comparison to many other states a really great potential, a lot of uh, technically uh, educated people, a lot of interest in developments of technology. So I think they are assets which uh, are very positive in order to bring uh, the, um, again uh, space activities on the screen here. And uh, uh, they are also small steps. I don't know whether you are aware that the Faculty of Law started again the block seminar in uh, space and telecommunication law, specialized one. Uh, we have a new master course in Luxembourg for space, communication and media law, where also Czech students are, uh, are participating. So there are some small things. And uh, uh, the last but not least, I think and it has been said already, uh, we should try to convince uh, other citizens that uh, space uh, activities uh, are part uh, of the everyday uh, of our everyday that we are using uh, gps that uh, we are using google map and others so uh, we should explain them that it is nothing which is just a luxury which is uh, just the wasting of money but it's something which uh, enhances and improves also the uh, every, uh, daily daily life thanks Thank you all for a uh, very interesting and inspiring uh, final remarks. I might just add to that that um, for, from the point of view of Czech Republic, the economic rationale is obviously there for a cheap uh, export-oriented economy based on export of foreign technology. It would make very much sense that we invest in our own innovation, our own industries, um, as well from the political point of view. For a small country, uh, that is a lot of times criticized for not having a foreign policy topic, a foreign policy theme or agenda. Um, I think space would be an ideal candidate. So with that, please join me for a round of applause to thank our panelists and thank you for your attention. <laughs>